Let me just start by asking you, how did you get started in, as a higher education IT professional? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I would be surprised if anyone who's honest with you were to tell you uh, that they, from the time they were in elementary school, had, had this <laughs> vision of becoming a higher ed CIO. And, uh, and, and by the time they were in high school, they had a plan. Uh, so I, I, I like to say that that my career has been an adventure and that uh, really more than having a plan, I followed the breadcrumbs. Uh, in college, I actually thought I was going to be a veterinarian. So I, I uh, did not follow any IT orthodoxy through computer science. I have a degree in biology and one in Russian area studies. I went to graduate school in history and that took me to uh, a natural progression to uh, uh, a short time as an archivist. And uh, when you're an archivist, you study workflows and you study uh, process flows and you learn about the life cycle of information. And, and that really does start to get into one of the channels uh, into this profession. I moved uh, pretty quickly from there into records management, which immerses you even more deeply into the information resources management uh, milieu. And then I found that I was good at turnarounds. And so my career really began at the university in the office of the general counsel of the University of California mm -hmm. in administration. And, uh, because I turned out to be good at turnarounds, I kept getting uh, bigger and stranger turnaround assignments and finally found myself in the IT organization of the University of California. Wow. It seems like a lot of people kind of fall into the IT profession. It's very strange. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, th there's no standard curriculum and there are a couple of pathways. You know, the orthodox one from my generation was you became... Uh, a software engineer and you moved up and you maybe went into systems analysis and then you went into management and then you went up the ladder. Yeah. Uh, but in fact, in the seventies and eighties or seventies, when I was coming up, uh, this information resources management. So focused more on the information side of the information systems equation mm -hmm. than on the system side, but it's mm -hmm. still, it was still at that time the minority pathway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, I was always a little bit of an odd duck because I, I worried more about the information and I worried more about how universities worked, uh, and I could fake my way through the technical stuff just well enough to not get caught most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. um, was there anybody in your path that inspired you towards leadership? You know, that, that, that's a fun question because it gets me thinking back. Um, I've been very lucky. I remember once, actually, you may remember this at Educause, we did a team building exercise where we talked about, you know, famous people we had met and everyone had one person. And I, of course, needed to talk about 10 people because I, <laughs> I really have been pretty lucky. Uh, but probably the most influential and, and certainly the most formative uh, for me, was my Uncle Joe. Um, my family background is uh, I'm the the son of the son of Jewish immigrants, and they came to the country pretty poor around 1915. Uh, six children, and uh, the oldest son, Joe, my uncle, uh, was really a brilliant businessman, and and he. Uh, uh, went to the University of Pittsburgh, but had to drop out because his father had a nervous breakdown and two of the brothers were in orphanages. So they were wow. dirt poor. Yeah. And uh, he and four of his brothers went on to uh, create a Fortune 500 company, which is uh, a pretty amazing thing. Yeah. Uh, and equally interesting in my mind is he wound up becoming uh, chair of the board of trustees of the University of Pittsburgh, where he went to school and was eternally grateful for the scholarship they'd given. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and they gave him an honorary degree because he never finished with a degree. Right. And, uh, you know, I'd like to think, I choose to think that I was his favorite nephew. He and I bonded uh, pretty heavily. I was a Boy Scout and he was on the National Boy Scout board. So he Uh pinned my uh, badges on me at the ceremonies. And he was the one that actually handed me my fake diploma when I graduated from the University of Pittsburgh and uh, and on his deathbed, actually, one of the uh, more important milestone work products, a report I had written, I gave to him and he read it on his deathbed and was, you know, wow. talk, we talked about it. So he was uh, hugely influential, of course, on That's my... That's amazing. And, and it was all by, by example. He never said, you know, let me show you how to do this, but just the way he lived his life uh, was inspirational to me. Uh, I had a wonderful first CIO boss. Uh, Richard West is my good friend still and uh, retired as uh, executive vice chancellor of the Cal State system. He was the CIO of the UC system at the time. Mm -hmm. And he really you know, whatever good I had in my management style, I learned from Richard, he was a superb manager. And he did me a big favor of, I don't know what it was about me, but uh, Richard was one of a fast crowd of 10 to 15 leaders. Uh, Bob Hedrick, the president of Educom, uh, Bill Graves, who won the leadership award for Educaus two years ago. And has passed away, Gary Augustin. Uh, just wonderful, wonderful generation of top leaders. And Richard was among them. And, and Richard somehow uh, convinced them that I was somebody worth knowing. You know, I was 28 at the time or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they accepted me. And uh, so I had this like <laughs> sort of council of uncles that were uh, kind of giving me responsibilities way beyond my pay grade mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, editing my work. And so that was, uh, I have to thank Richard always for that. And of course, you know, Brian Hawkins, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Brian showed me a whole different form of leadership. Uh, you know, Brian, you know, I teased him once and mentioned, since I have an MBA, uh, the servant leadership. And Brian, of course, had done, unbeknownst to me, uh, some of his academic publishing in that whole area. And, and Brian was a genuinely humble, uh, self-effacing guy. And, you know, I could never be that. I'm a much more flamboyant person than (laughs) Brian is. And so we actually were probably well matched to to each other that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, but Brian had the capacity to entertain ideas that he hated uh, and actually throw out what he came into any discussion with really often in favor of ideas he might not even like, but that seem to be better ideas. You know, more people. That's so rare nowadays. That's so rare. Wow. I I, got to tell you, I'm, I've tried to learn to bite my tongue and listen more and more, especially learning from the inspiration of Brian's style. You know, I'll die never having a tenth of what he had in that. And and that's that's really an unbelievable thing to have people around the table with different ideas. You have your own ideas. You don't lose that because you're the leader. But you don't get your idea to win every day either. And that's a, you know, that's not when you're the boss, you'd like to think, well, I'm the boss because I'm the smartest. And if I'm the smartest, my ideas are always or almost always the best and uh right right. and that's really not leadership and brian was a great great example to me of how how you do that and uh that's great yeah wow yeah i miss brian miss 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 his leadership yeah me too it's great 
Uh, I'm sorry about my cat here. He's. Uh, oh, I love your cat. I have my dog here who was actually verbalizing before we connected. Yeah. And I thought you would have dog uh, whimpers in the background. There's something about my cat who, like, especially when I'm doing something online, he's got a – that's when he knows he wants to get involved. It's funny. Excellent. Um, so let me, let me go back just quickly to your uncle because um, you talked about – him creating a business and him coming from from poverty, really. And uh, what what would you say are one or two qualities that you got from him? What what is it you learn? You feel like you learned from him? You know, one thing I would that's a that's a very interesting question. I I, I certainly suspect that I got. I, I consider myself for both good and bad as a, as a bit of an audacious personality and and I think my audacity is part of uh, my success that that a I think out of the box often and b I'm vain enough or stubborn enough or persistent enough to uh, continue pushing in the face of people's often discomfort that, you know, wait, that's a new crazy idea, Richard, we can't do that. You know, and I think that that's an audacious set of behaviors uh, often casts me in a minority role, which is frankly not always fun. Right. Uh, but in fact, if organizations don't uh, care for and nurture their most audacious voices, uh, at the very best, they're going to live within the ordinary boundaries of their uh, organizational culture. And again, back to Brian, you know, Brian, Brian was the reverse, whatever the reverse of audacity or audaciousness <laughs> is, that's him. And so I think I made Brian constantly uncomfortable. <laughs> um, and to his ever loving credit, you know, uh, he knew that I was both stubborn enough and right enough often enough uh, that in spite of the discomfort I would cause him with my crazy ideas and my you know, everybody in the herd would be going this way and Richard would be going that way. Uh, he would listen to Richard and, you know, I certainly didn't win every time, but, uh, but I got my share and uh, more than with most bosses. So, That's uh, great. So I, I I've, heard, I've heard my uncle and, and I also right. got, uh, well, let, let's leave it at audacity. I had another one, but we've probably no. That's it. great. That's a that's a that's a unique quality, though. That's that's not you know that's not the run of the mill quality people talk about. So <laughs> I like that. Now I don't really love this question. I didn't write it, but uh, but but we'll we'll do this. One. Oh, we're gonna cope. What would you say is has been your greatest accomplishment? That's such a weird question. I, I um, know, and, and I I really you know. You know, it's so easy to reach in and grab your last right happy accomplishment and call it your greatest because the memory's fresher. But, you know, I mean, obviously, most of the Educause community that's going to listen to part of this interview is going to say ECAR because that's A, pretty recent. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and B, it landed with a, you know, quite a, quite a momentous bang. Yeah. And I loved it. I mean, you know, ECAR, you know, it has been a sort of fanatical drive in my career to help uh, university administrators talk about their performance in a more quantitatively rich way. Uh, higher ed gets beat up hourly uh, for substandard performance, you know, good enough for government work kinds of things. Uh, I believe that that's to a very great extent unfair. 
And uh, at the same time, we've never developed a language or a discipline behind that language to communicate what we do and how well we do it. So I've had that burning desire. I manifested that at the University of California in a three-year project. Uh, and it was certainly behind my thinking at ECAR. Mm -hmm. And I think that to a great extent, the ECAR experiment, if you will, and again, this is a thanks to Brian's support and the boards uh, that got off the ground. But I think it was a successful experiment and it gave uh, CIOs uh, an empirical capacity yeah. to make the case for whatever investments they were asking their provost or leadership to invest in, in a new way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and quite honestly, part of that, your reaction to my audacity answer is CIOs uh, are, are a wonderful community. You know the Educause community as well as I do, and they're wonderful people. Mm -hmm. You know, but on the whole, they're probably not the world's best communicators. So on one hand, you're probably asking for more money than most of the executive staff of any university because you're buying large scale computing equipment and you've got armies of staff. Uh, and on the other hand, you may not be a great communicator. And so you're, you're going in and asking for big things and you don't have a, um, an impressive arsenal of ways to ask for it. Uh, and then you don't have an impressive language or arsenal uh, with which to convey, look how well those investments we made performed. So that's the long story short, both about eCar and about a project called the Partnership for Performance that IBM and I uh, unroll at the University of California those are two of my big ones. Uh, the other one that, that uh, was so magical is I worked with a group of University of California vice chancellors for business, budget officers, and a few CIOs uh, to plan the 10th campus, 10th actually, 10th, 11th, and 12th campus uh, mm -hmm. of the university and to plan its business uh, architecture. And we went about it in the classical way of doing regression analysis and saying, well, at this size, uh, we're gonna need so many people in IT and so many in HR and so many in capital programs and so forth. Mm -hmm. But at one point, one of the vice chancellors said, you know, that's all backward looking and kind of reinventing all of our mistakes. and the truth be known, if we were going to invent a university from scratch, would we really reproduce what we've created as good as the University of California is? Nobody's ever said, gee, what a great administration. I think we ought to, you know, package that up and sell them in volume. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what we did at that point is throw away all of the work that we had done for the past months that was backward looking and say, let's start with a blank piece of paper and say, what would we invent? So that became a visioning exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, the result of that became a document called Sustaining Excellence in the 21st Century, which caused then published as its second professional paper. And that at least three of the university campuses adopted as their blueprint, if you will, for their administration. And then I would get calls out of the blue from the University of Toronto. They saying, we've done it. And I said, what have you done? <laughs> well, we took your blueprint and we put it into practice. So uh, oh, that, has so to that be document feeling. became uh, kind of a major international uh, signpost, if you will. Uh, and pretty much is what catapulted me personally into the uh, international limelight, which is how I found my way into cause. So mm -hmm. I'd say those those projects were probably, I, I couldn't pick which singular one is my, my favorite. Uh, the key thing in this, Jerry, when I think about it is 
the things that I feel best about are the things that are still there. So, you know, campus is still right to me saying, you know, I'm still basically implementing sustaining excellence. And that's, that's 1992. Uh, or the Partnership for Performance, which was 1994, still exists. They are still using the uh, metrics across 15 different administrative categories, functions, and nine campuses at UC. And ECAR is still, you know, it's changed, but it's still, its core mission is still intact. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, to me, if you're a, a leader, you know, you measure your success in legacies. You know, it's what have you done that's got legs, you know? Anything that's kind of, you know, done and forgotten in 18 months, yeah, I don't even put those in the win category. Right. I've got to last five years for me to even consider it being one of my favorites. Well, that's got to just be a great feeling to have created something and all these years later see it still functioning as a living thing. You know? Yep. And we all, you know, we're all around long enough. Uh, you know, one of my dearest friends, my my first hire, in fact, became uh, just retired as vice president of Cal State Long Beach. But uh, she took over one of my responsibilities. And I remember getting invited to her dismantling of the award-winning program that I had mantled <laughs> years before. So, you know, you live long enough, you see your work undone, you see it superseded. That's, you know, I'm not so vain to think that it's going to be around in 50 years. Right. But, you know, you do want to get a good 5, 10, 15, 20 years out of a really mm -hmm. good, a really good score. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> well, um, speaking of over the years, what, what are some of the changes in higher education, especially the higher ed IT community, that, that is, have, have made an impression on you uh, over the years? Because I feel like we live in a, quite a different world than even five, 10 years ago. You know, the, the coolest thing to me, Jerry, is that you don't have to be ancient. I, I mean, I'm no longer a young man, although in my brain I am. Uh, but uh, I've now been around long enough, probably 40 years in this profession. And it's a profession that's only been around 50 or 55 years. So, so I described how Richard West introduced me to his generation of top leaders, you know, but I've also, you know, met Vint Cerf and that generation. So, so, you know, I, I've managed to, have a career that uh, has been long enough in span to, you know, I wasn't part of the white lab coat, you know, ENIAC whirlwind generation, um, but I was there from the next generation on. And so there have been a huge number of changes. Uh, my first meeting of the common solutions group was probably around 1995 mm -hmm. and csg as you know is a small uh, collection of like institutions whose mission originally was to find projects of sufficient commonality that they would invest and create a common solution and i don't know how many colleges are in that consortium. Uh, but when I went to my first meeting, there were probably 70 or 80 folks. Uh, we met in Boulder and 69 of the folks were men and there was Jane Ryland, my boss at cause, uh, the president of cause. And, you know, I just remember meetings where it was seas of men uh, many wearing ties, uh, many being sort of math, computer science, uh, shoelaces untied, zippers open, you know, right, right. not 
you know, what your your classic, you know, Bill Gates at age 24 uh, kind of image of what computing and telecom were back in the day. Uh, and within five years, you know, my boss was Jane, a woman, uh, the chair of the board of cause uh, when I first came was Susan Foster at the University of Delaware and the first EDUCAUSE president was or uh, chair of the board was Polly McClure, uh, Annie Stunden and Jacqueline Brown chaired the PD committee that I was uh, staffed to. So you know, the first gigantic change uh, was the emergence of women, uh, both in the profession, but more importantly in the leadership of the profession because you know, as I see the arc of how this profession, especially in higher education, is evolving, you know, the magic is less and less about uh, the invention of the technology or what I call tinkering. You know, the first generations of uh IT professionals were male and they were tinkerers. Mm -hmm. You know, what we need today is people who do partnering and uh, people who have the kind of skill sets uh, that foster the capacity of organizations uh, to embrace the technologies. And, and those kinds of behaviors, they're not exclusive to women, but they are more evident, in my opinion, in women than they are in men. And so uh, we need those kinds of uh, qualities, the ability to really reach across tables, to really uh, form relationships, and to... Uh, lower anxieties and fears that represent barriers to adoption of new technologies. And those are qualities that at least, at the very least, we can learn from women. Sure. Uh, so I think we're going to, I think we are seeing a, a more and more gender friendly profession. Certainly by no means there. Right. Uh, on the other side, you know, a couple of things I worry about that are also changes is, well, one, the, the kind of racial, ethnic makeup of the profession really hasn't changed. And right. if you read the uh, studies from the NSF and so forth, the, you know, women in STEM statistics uh, are not going in the right direction. So I, I don't know... Uh, you know, how we encourage more people of color yeah. to make their way into the profession. So that, that hasn't changed. Uh, and the other thing is that, you know, we're moving, I think, very quickly into a period, uh, as you see the so-called cloud uh, mature, that really the capacity to operate large scale enterprise systems, uh, networks and more is, is really moving very quickly or should move quickly uh, to the cloud. And this represents a huge change to the profession because both the, uh, the human scale of computing is changing so you don't necessarily want to build your army of three, four hundred uh, people to operate campus computing organizations. And the role of, of the leadership in a, quote, cloudified world is also changing. Yeah. So let me stop there. But, uh, you know, it, it, is a, it is a very interesting you know, this profession's all about change uh, in an industry that's a thousand years old and all about constancy, which is what makes the 
you know, that's the sweet tension mm -hmm. uh, of this career. Yeah. I just, I mean, I got the last little bit of, uh, I started college in 89. So I just got the last little bit of the sense that like everybody was building their own things, you know, you had decentralized computing, you had you, the, the university computing center building their own servers. Everything was, it felt like a, it felt like a real, it felt more organic, but it was probably more imperfect. But now it feels like nobody's building anything. It's all third party stuff. I feel like that's a big change. And I feel like you touched on that a little bit. Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, on one hand, uh, and, and that started with the introduction of the PC, computing became personal. It became accessible. It became, you know, when you introduce the web, it becomes, you know, visually rich. It becomes moderately, so to speak, easy. Right. All of the complexity, though, is actually behind the curtain. Exactly. Getting deeper and deeper and deeper. But what it means is that the complexity on one hand is beyond the reach of most college and universities. And it's drifted to, it's beyond the reach of most companies. You're now, you know, okay. you, you get the Googles and the Apples and, you know, the gigantic uh, behemoths have the capacity uh, to move the needle on the technology. Yeah. Uh, and on the other hand, you know, the user community is because things are getting easier and because they are now acculturated to a level of use, you know, they're more and more independent and less and less reliant on, I've got to call the help desk. Right. Right. I mean, you know, who calls the help desk? I mean, <laughs> Yeah, Go Google your question. You'll figure it out. Yeah, totally. exactly. And so uh, you know, you've got to ask yourself the question: Well, if my users don't need me the same way they did 15 years ago, I mean, when I started, you had to know how to set your dip switches for heaven's sake. I mean, <laughs> and I'm not a mechanical guy. Right. Uh, and on the other hand, the deep technology is now so deep that you know, you need a PhD in AI to be able to operate. And, right. you know, most institutions can't afford those people. Right. right. Uh, but in fact, universities do and will continue to need IT organizations. It's just that IT organizations and their leaders need to rethink what the needs are and how to satisfy them, because that's, I think that's changing very, very quickly. And if you keep solving the old problems with the old organization, you're going to fairly soon find yourself isolated with very little support from your general campus leadership that says, you know, Microsoft can do this cheaper. Salesforce can do it cheaper. IBM can do it cheaper. You know, why are we doing this? Right, right. That's uh, interesting stuff. It is uh, interesting. Let me get to these other questions here real quick. We're running a little bit long, but that's okay. Um, when you think about your career, what lessons have you learned that you'd like to pass along to maybe somebody starting in the field? Do you have anything, any career advice for people? <laughs> well, that's reserved for, you know, you know they, they ask the winners of these awards to give a uh, a session at Edge. Oh, right, yes, yes. And I, I, you know, for years I said, oh, I'm never going to give one of those. Here's what I learned in my career. <laughs> right, and right. I find myself writing a here's what I learned in my career speech. Right. Uh, yeah, I have some advice. I mean, I have this conversation with my wife all the time, but honest to gosh, I mean, this is not bull, Jerry, but mm -hmm. I, I have actually loved every job I had. And quite honestly, I mean, it, I dropped out of college and worked for a year wiping butts in a nursing home. And I even found things to love in, in being an orderly. Uh, and and that, that would be my first lesson is that there is something to love in every job. Mm -hmm. And it is your job to find it. Uh, you know, so many people that I've worked with and that you work with, 
you know, they're sad sacks. You know, they can't wait till five o'clock to get out of there. And they wake up in the morning groaning, dreading going into the office. And, and I have to say, I've, I've never felt that way. And so if you're really unhappy with your job, my advice is get out. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's a circumstance that's controllable in your situation, you know, fix it. Take responsibility for it and do your best to fix it. If you can't fix it, revert to get out. Right. Uh, but basically life is too short. Uh, you know, I, I, you're probably not aware, but you know, I nearly died three months ago. I had a oh, no. staph infection and emergency surgery and blah, blah. Well, I'm glad and, you're okay. You know, you, you don't have to wait for that kind of situation to realize Oh my gosh, I've been dragging my behind into the office for the past five years and taking my fellow employees for granted and, and not, you know, thanking God every day that I have this neat job. Uh, and uh, it'd be a better, happier world if everybody sort of followed that advice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Richard West also taught me, which is a wonderful pithy <laughs> insight, uh, run until tackled. You know, <laughs> get, just, get, if you think you know what you need to do to do the right thing, chase it. Chase yeah. it. Run, run, you know, run, Forrest, run. Uh, that goes right and, along with audaciousness. Well, and, and, it's, and it is by nature. And, and, and again, back to Brian and his leadership style, he understood that you can't mm. Richard on a short leash. Right, right. <laughs> so, you know, he would just like, Richard, go downfield and run your ass off right. and I'll get the ball to you. And uh, I'm not really good at playbook number 362 or whatever. Right, it right. Uh, but I think everybody, you know, most everybody's heart's in the right place and, they're, and they've got the competency. And if you've got that and you're aligned with your mission of your organization, just do it. You know, mm -hmm. it's the uh, mm -hmm. Nike's advice. And then there's John Patrick was an IBM exec and he came up with a, with, I think, great advice, which was think big, start simple and iterate fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, you know, I mean, you know, maybe Steve Jobs would have said that, but that, you know, so many organizations uh, think and act incrementally in a world that's changing by leaps and, and bounds. And uh, I think we're at a time where we need big thinking. And, uh, you know, that doesn't have to mean that you implement sloppy or anything like that, because um, that's not the same conversation but you at least need to put your vision to the future it has to be a big one, has to be an audacious one, has to be an inspirational one, and has to be one that kind of motivates people to, you know, follow you, you know, think of Columbus or mm -hmm. any other, you know, these people got on these rickety old wooden boats and went off to an ocean they thought, you know, had an edge and that you'd fall off of. Right. Hey, what a what a sales job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, what's one characteristic you think every leader should possess? Again, I, I hate the questions with one, but I'll right, stick, right. I'll try to stick to it. <laughs> I, I'll tell you the one thing this leader uh, was committed to possessing, and that is. Uh, I think anyone that's worked for me will tell you that Richard was committed to excellence and quality uh, in, in everything he did. And he imposed that uh, expectation or uh, assumption on everyone that ever worked for him. It, it was, I remember Brian once accused me in a, in a negative way. He said, Richard, you're demanding. 
And my answer to him was, yes, I am. Uh, I think I may have learned that from my Uncle Joe. You know, you didn't, if you didn't do a first class job, go back and do a first class job. There's right. not, the world's too full of schlock. And uh, if you really want to move the needle in any important way in your life and your career, um, then do the, do a better job than you can even imagine. Yeah. That's great oh, advice. That's mine. I like that. Um, this is a double question. It's the last question. Um, what do you see coming in our industry in the next five years or so? And how can we, how can we prepare for the challenges ahead? Wow. Yeah, that's, we that's can a big do one. Do a whole hour on yeah, that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I have to say that I'm both hopeful, fearful uh, for the future. You know, the fearfulness is, you know, I just read a book on the demographics of higher ed, and, and quite honestly, they're fairly grim. Uh, we've got a, uh, a baby bust. I forget his specific. He had an alliterative mm -hmm. metaphor for the Darth of... Uh, students in the pipeline to uh, college and university, but there is one. Uh, it's been well understood and known for the <laughs> demographics you can plan decades in advance. Uh, and that will result in lowered uh, political support for universities and colleges, which we're already suffering, uh, reduced funding. And, uh, increased polarization between the have universities and colleges and the have nots. Mm -hmm. And, and I worry a lot about the creation of a two caste system, you know, where the uh, elite institutions, the medallion institutions continue to uh, pursue multi-billion dollar capital campaigns and, and get them and sport 20, 30, 40 billion dollar endowments uh, while the rest of higher education scrambles for fewer and fewer students doing more and more tuition discounting and cutting more and more administrative staff and hiring more and more adjuncts. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a grim reality. Yeah. Uh, and that the grimness is not leavened by our <laughs> incapacity to uh, make more than incremental change. I mean, we need we need more than across the board four percent budget cuts to deal with the reality that I just described. Uh, and I think technology holds the key to a non-incremental capacity to address the changing reality that I described. But again, technology without that capacity to uh, win hearts and minds and get the leadership of the institution to have the courage to act boldly, if you will, to be audacious, mm -hmm to break eggs, uh, then all the technology in the world just becomes cost additive and adds to the problem, not to the solution. So that's the fearful side of my vision. You know, the positive side is, you know, we are entering this third wave or whatever you want to call it of technology that's, you know, big data, predictive analytics, AI, dot, dot, dot. And, and that stuff really moves much more closely uh, to the people side of the equation. You know, what people do, how work is organized, process and people. And if there's courage in the equation, the technologies are now getting mature enough to really uh, facilitate dramatic change. 
but once again, you know, it's a question of, you know, which of our institutional leaders will have the guts to say, wow, look at what they did at Georgia Tech using AI chatbots to basically replace, let's not talk supplement, to replace TAs, and that eight out of 10 of the students in the first iteration of this didn't even know they were engaging online with a chat bot and not a human. Right. Now, if you can start to say, how do we intelligently, thoughtfully, cautiously deploy AI chatbots for teaching, for counseling, for housing, for job placement, for any variety of things where people are saying, I don't understand this. Can you explain? Mm -hmm. uh, we could revolutionize the higher education workforce. I mean, right now, instead, we hire more and more adjuncts, which quite honestly, uh, to me, is one of the great crimes of our time. We pay these people $2,000 to teach a course and claim that we're preserving that great personal touch of higher education. Right. Many of them have no office. Students rarely see them in less than 100 to 1 ratios. <clears throat> it's not, in my mind, a high quality uh, experience for the students. And it's a, frankly, low quality experience for many of the adjuncts. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yet we would tremble at the idea um, that we would use a chat bot <laughs> instead of... Right. We want it both ways, it sounds like. Yeah. Instead of a freeway flyer or somebody sitting in a darkened apartment somewhere right. making less than minimum wage. I mean, it, it's just awful. It's terrible. Uh, wow. So I'm really hope you know, the hopeful side of me is that our backs, frankly, will be pressed enough against the wall uh, that some leaders somewhere will say enough. You know, the model uh, that we have been nurturing with great success for the past, let's say, post-World War II years in the U.S. is running out of steam very quickly and a host of new exciting technologies are really showing their stuff. What needs to happen is we need to make some hard decisions and we need to uh, take on the blowback. And there will be, uh, I would also predict there will be significant uh, tension, we can call it, that's probably a euphemism, uh, between the faculty and the administration yeah. Uh, as these new technologies uh, start to prove out. Uh, but what we can't do is what we've always done, which is to say, these are great technologies. They will augment our already great business model. Right. Because something's going to break. Uh, you can't keep adding cost and decreasing students. Uh, that just doesn't, and raising prices. I mean, that's, yeah. that's not a winning formula. <laughs> well, you know, it's, I look at it as not to get political about this, but I, it's, it, we're so, we're so married to tradition. You know, I mean, look at the electoral college, completely outdated system. We're never going to change it because people don't understand. People are scared of some, a really new system. It, it creates suspicion. It creates fear. And so we just never change the actual skeleton of the system. It, well, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, what people don't realize in that scenario that you just described is that, that do, the consequences of doing nothing can often become much more frightening uh, than the thing you fear that keeps right. you holding on <laughs> to the yeah. status quo. Yeah. So last thing I want to ask you is, how did you hear about the award? When, when did you find out you won, and were you surprised? Where was I? I, I got a call. I think uh, I was 
at a meeting of the, I, I was a trustee of Ashford University, uh, a dear friend of mine is president there. And I got a call from the chair of the uh, Educause Recognition Committee. Uh, and I won't ever forget her uh, phraseology. She said, Richard, congratulations. I'm calling to say that you are a co-winner of this year's award and that uh, uh, our committee had to deal with a pool of talent that was wide and deep. That, those were her words. And she conveyed to me that, uh, you know, that A, I was very qualified for the award, which I still don't see myself that way. Uh, but B, that it was a very, very deep and, and wide pool. And so I was very tickled. The, the other thing I won't forget is, you know, I, I, as I said, I've always loved my work and, and frankly, my work was always its own reward. You know, I, I, I would get up in front of Educause and ECAR audiences and say, you know, and, and I really meant it. I have the best job in the world. Mm -hmm. I didn't want Brian's job. I, I love, I'm too audacious to be right. president of Educause. <laughs> I would say something and I'd wind up in trouble. <laughs> I, I'm just not cautious enough. Right. Uh, and I know that about myself and, and, and that's fine because I had Brian to be my cover uh, because he is an adult and, and I could be that kind of childlike uh, uh, intrapreneur that worked at the edges of the organization uh, where I have more degrees of freedom. And that's where my style of leadership Really, and I think you're the same way. You're you're definitely. Uh, yeah, I don't you know, want to be in the political position. Yeah, 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 definitely. Well, that's great. I'm congratulations on the award, and thank right. you for taking all this time to talk to me. It was very, very enjoyable, and it <laughs> was a pleasure. With, yeah, it's good to connect with you again. And like I said, I will. Um, I'm going to edit this minimally, and I'll send you a, a private YouTube link here uh, <laughs> in the next week or so. Yeah, you may you may need to use a you know a blunter instrument, but whatever, <laughs> my blessing to do whatever needs to be done. Right on. Well, you have a good weekend, Richard, and, and thank you so much. Yeah, it was fun, Jerry. Thanks yeah. a lot. You 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 do do this well. I knew that, but this this brings oh. another level of insight to that. Oh, good. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Oh, and by the way, I, you know, I'm good friends with Colin Curry and. Uh -huh. And I didn't know that Colin is working on oh, yeah. it. And, and he loves the work and he loves you. He so. loves doing that. He lo I, I, I count on him every year. He's great. Yeah. That, he is great. So I'm yeah. really glad you're doing that with him. Cool. Well, maybe I'll see you in Denver. Are you coming to the meeting? Oh, yeah. You oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, I will definitely look for you. Cool. Cool. Well, I'll see you soon, man. Thanks for doing this. Oh, sure. Thanks, Thanks man. Have a good weekend. You too. Bye.